assessments is a key part of the B2B work. And um, before Christmas, we had some discussion about assessments to be a key product out of the B2B work. And I spoke a little bit about the Arctic assessments. So it'd be nice not to see what has been done in part of the North Atlantic. And so that's what I would like to introduce to you the um, Professor Ivan Fernandez, Professor in Soil Science at the University of Maine. And he will tell us about the assessment they have done in Maine. So then I give you the floor and uh, looking forward to hear what you have to present. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, let me arrange my screen. There we go. Uh, well, thank you all for, for having me uh, here today to uh, talk about some of what's gone on in, in uh, Maine. I, I appreciate, Bob, you reaching out and uh, I enjoyed our, our, our discussion about some of these activities. It's, uh, it's rainy up here uh, in, in Maine this morning, um, but certainly much more pleasant temperatures than it is where you are, Bob, in, uh, in Florida. So you, you, you'll need to get up here. There's a few faces uh, on this uh, panel that I, I know and <laughs> are local, Dave and, and Lloyd. Uh, but most of you I've never met uh, before, and it's an honor to, uh, to be here. I've really enjoyed uh, learning about your initiative relative to the Bermuda to Bear Island um, uh, activities. And uh, uh, thrilled to be able to talk a little bit about what's uh, gone on here in Maine. Uh, and so I'll, um, I'll run through some slides and describe what, uh, what our process has been. Uh, and then I, I think we have some uh, time for, for questions after that, and uh, I look forward to it. Um, so I, I title this Maine's Climate Future. I think of some of the activities, particularly out of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, and um, uh, m many of you uh, know Paul Majewski, uh, our, our director that I've worked with on these things. Um, we uh, Maine has had uh, a, a lot of activity in climate change back to the into the 2000s, uh, and then politics as they are uh, have seen periods of a lot of activity and, and uh, significantly less activity. Um, and fortunately, we've returned to a, a, a pretty aggressive uh, posture on it, uh, addressing the climate tri uh, crisis. Um, Maine's Climate Future is the title of some reports that we've produced out of the Climate Change Institute. And you can download those off the Institute's website. Uh, the first one we did in 2009 that prompted some um, work in the state uh, around uh, adaptation. And then we've had updates in 2015 and, and 2020. And, and in this past year, uh, the, this assessment work has uh, uh, gone on in uh, the, the uh, committee in, uh, that I'll talk about that's supporting uh, the council. So the the recent past, the last couple of years, I've got to get this to go. There we go. Um, in uh, June of 2019, uh, Governor Janet Mills, the governor of our, our state, uh, uh, relatively newly elected at that point, um, uh, signed into law uh, a, a, a bill that created the Maine Climate Council. Uh, and the Maine Climate Council began to convene in uh, September of 2019. Uh, and between 2019 uh, and the December of 2020, so just a few months ago, um, there was a tremendous amount of activity by the council to develop a, a climate action plan, which was due to be delivered uh, on December 1st of 2020. And, and it was. Um, and, and so that was a relatively quick um, uh, process. Uh, and, and therefore an intense process. And of course, as we all know, um, a pandemic arrived in the middle of that, which uh, caused us all to migrate as so many of us have um, and, and keep on uh, moving forward, but uh, mostly in the mode that we're in uh, here this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are on our planet. Uh, and in, in December of um, uh, this past year, uh, uh, the Maine's Climate Action Plan, Maine's uh, integrated, first integrated climate action plan uh, was delivered and uh, Governor Mills entitled it, uh, Maine Won't Wait, uh, which 
um, spoke to the urgency that um, she brought to the issue of climate change in her, uh, her new administration um, and um, the, the need to act and not uh, establish just a new uh, effort at, um, at study and, and reports. Uh, Maine had a climate action plan in 2004 that focused on mitigation um, and basically met, met its targets. Um, and then a brief uh, period where they developed a climate, uh, uh, an initial uh, a preliminary climate adaptation plan following our initial uh, Maine Climate Future Report in 2009. And that, that initial um, uh, adaptation plan was delivered in 2010. Um, and then we had an election and things changed and uh, not a lot happened at state government level in Maine um, uh, for a period of time after that. Uh, and so that's why I, I emphasize the importance, at least to me, of this being the first integrated climate action plan that really encompasses uh, both the goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, as well as building resilience uh, and the, the significant overlap of those two enterprises um, all under one cohesive framework for the state. And so it's a, it's a really a, a, a hallmark uh, uh, plan in, uh, in our opinion, my opinion. Um, and of course, uh, none too soon, uh, given the, the need to act and what, what's going on in the rest of our, the world. Some of the uh, background of the uh, Council, the, uh, the council itself is a 39 member council. Um, it's, it includes uh, scientists, industry leaders, uh, uh, and bipartisan, both political parties represented from um, state government uh, and, and various levels of government, as well as uh, some from the private sector, fisher and farmer and uh, other citizens on the, on the panel. Uh, there's two scientists on the, uh, on the panel. Uh, I'm honored to be uh, one of those uh, two, uh, but the panels, uh, but the uh, council, I'm sorry, uh, but the council's work is supported by two subcommittees and six working groups. Uh, and so what we see here is the, the scientific and technical subcommittee um, that was appointed initially on, on the left-hand side there. Um, I, I co-chair the scientific and technical subcommittee with uh, Barb Marvini, who's our uh, in Maine, our state geologist and the head of our Maine geologic survey. Um, and our charge was to develop the best available science um, uh, because the, the governor was um, quite focused on the importance of science guiding the decision making, um, which uh, we of course uh, agree and wholeheartedly support. Uh, and particularly to focus on Maine science relative to understanding climate uh, change, the biophysical character of a changing climate and its impacts in Maine. Um, we have uh, IPCC and we have in the US the National Climate Assessment um, and, and regional uh, aspects of the national climate uh, components of the National Climate Assessment, um, all of which are phenomenal documents. Uh, on this call here is Dave, David Reemiller who took a leadership role in developing some of those national documents. Um, but local decision making uh, in, at, the, at the state level and uh, county level and community level uh, is best served by also having insight into uh, the changes that are happening uh, basically all around us. Uh, and so that was a high priority for uh, the, the science and technical uh, subcommittee. Uh, the equity subcommittee is actually a new subcommittee that was established uh, after uh, an equity assessment was conducted by uh, uh, an organization called the Mitchell Center that's here at the University of Maine um, on the strategies that were being developed. And, and the outcome of that was to establish a, an ongoing entity in support of, of the council work. Uh, and then there are the six working groups that literally had hundreds of people that were involved. Um, some scientists, but a lot of these were stakeholders and community members and uh, members of, uh, of, um, of, of government. Uh, they are, you know, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, subjects, of, as you might expect, transportation, buildings, energy, 
uh, various aspects of community, uh, coastal and marine, and then uh, natural and, and working lands. Uh, and each of these developed a set of strategies that they were recommending to the council. Uh, and then the council uh, received those in June of 2020. Uh, and then the council worked to develop the final action plan um, that from all of that activity um, uh, resulted in the overarching um, eight strategies that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and uh, under this, these uh, four primary goals of the main climate action plan. Uh, and they are, to no surprise, uh, to reduce Maine's greenhouse gas emissions uh, first and foremost. And we'll talk in a minute about what our trajectory has been. Um, that's the mitigation part, uh, to make Maine more resilient to the impacts of climate. Um, that, that's the adaptation part. Um, to foster economic opportunity and prosperity. Uh, even before the pandemic, this was viewed as um, a, a transformational uh, framework that would uh, grow the economy uh, as well as uh, address climate. Uh, the pandemic, of course, has only made that even more, uh, more pointed and, and urgent uh, and um, a, a clear uh, priority along with mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, advance equity through Maine's climate response, as I already mentioned, um, uh, that has been ongoing, a high priority in the past year, particularly in the states, uh, the uh, focus on equity and social justice has been um, uh, even more evident and the need to act. And so th this is, ends up being a comprehensive uh, social, economic and, uh, and climate response, if we would, um, that comes at a particularly transformational time for Maine and, and for all of us. Uh, in Maine, greenhouse gas emissions have a distribution that um, is summarized here. Uh, about 54% of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions comes from our transportation sector. So uh, basically uh, electrifying transportation is, is a high priority. Uh, about 30% comes from um, buildings, uh, heat, uh, cooling, uh, lighting, uh, residential and commercial. So that's the 19 and the 11%. Um, about 9% from industrial and 7% and from electric power. We, are, we already have a lot of renewables as, as uh, uh, hydro and, uh, and uh, some wind, uh, et cetera, here in the state. Um, and so, uh, that is a, a lower component, lower contributor as compared to um, many other countries and certainly the US uh, national average. Uh, I should mention that this, um, this breakdown does not include emissions from wood. Um, and so wood burning, um, as you probably all well know, uh, are familiar with, uh, is a complicated issue um, with, as, as a renewable energy source. Uh, and the um, uh, state reporting requirements have been to report based on uh, fossil fuel consumption. Um, in the report, they included data on estimates of wood burning. Going forward, that will be uh, a, a, a part of the uh, port report you see in the center here. It's, uh, the source is our main Department of Environmental Protection. Um, this, these data are based on the eighth biennial report, the last report. Uh, the, going forward now, uh, uh, wood and other aspects of greenhouse gas emissions will uh, be more comprehensively presented to facilitate um, the, um, the work on the main climate action plan going forward. Uh, so this is what um, the, uh, trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Maine have looked like. Um, we've used a base year of 1990. Uh, the 2004 action plan, mitigation plan, um, had as a, a target for us to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions below the 1990 level by 2020 uh, by 10%, which we met. Um, the reporting hasn't gotten to that yet, but we were, uh, we're below our target. Um, the, the challenge is going forward, there were no additional targets um, in statute uh, and uh, obvious, or not obviously, but I, uh, it's important to recognize that 
continued progress at this rate of uh, decline uh, is going to be significantly more difficult. Uh, the Maine Climate Action Plan, Maine Won't Wait, has uh, two targets for gross greenhouse gas emissions of 45% reduction uh, below 1990 by 2030 and 80% below 1990 uh, by 2050. In addition, uh, Governor Mills signed uh, an executive order uh, and presented it before the United Nations actually to have Maine carbon, be carbon neutral uh, by 2045. Uh, and so there's a, a great deal of uh, interest and energy and, and discussions in Maine about um, measuring our carbon uh, and our greenhouse gas uh, uh, cycling and emissions and how our activities can contribute to uh, achieving carbon neutrality by that, that target date. Uh, the, the kind of information that uh, supported the um, council's deliberations beyond the working group strategies, uh, some examples are, are represented here. Um, on the left is the scientific uh, assessment that the scientific and technical subcommittee did, uh, about 30 scientists, uh, mostly from, uh, from Maine. Uh, the documents about, uh, or, or is, 370 pages uh, and uh, really uh, provided the framework. We did an initial working document version of it actually quite quick, quite uh, quickly, quite fast. Um, at the very beginning of the council process, uh, the council convened in uh, September of 2019 and by January of 2020, so three months later, um, we had an initial version of this uh, in order to put the best available science in front of uh, all of the working groups that were working on strategies. Uh, and then we continued to uh, refine that to the final, this final report that was delivered uh, in August of, uh, of 2020. Uh, in addition, there were consultants involved with some um, cost benefit analyses relative to various scenarios for greenhouse gas um, mitigation using uh, modeling that was uh, input to the process. Um, I mentioned the equity assessment done by the Mitchell Center here at the University of Maine. That's just the cover of it. Um, and then there's been uh, significant um, economic planning by uh, state government and out of the governor's office uh, that parallels many of the goals, particularly on the mitigation side uh, of the action plan. Uh, and so this report was also released in uh, last fall, just a month before um, the climate action plan and um, uh, coincides with uh, many of the, uh, the objectives of the action plan uh, that resulted. Uh, so to dig a little deeper, I, I you know part of or focus here this morning was to or this afternoon where uh, to talk about uh, how science has informed our process and it really has uh, from start to 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 the present uh, with uh, uh, many of us being involved with discussions with people out of the governor's office and how uh, to assemble the uh, the council and the work of the council. Uh, that this is the table of contents of our scientific and technical assessment report. Um, just to give you a feel for, um, no surprises here, just to give you a feel for the kind of uh, subjects or uh, topics and chapters that were included um, about the, the uh, physical climate, uh, and hydrology and meteorology, um, changing oceans, um, uh, Biodiversity, uh, important in uh, all of our, uh, our countries. Um, some of the uh, sectors like forestry and agriculture. Um, uh, human health uh, is a particularly a critical area. Uh, and then we had one chapter on Maine's economy and, and climate change. Uh, we did, this report did not include, um, and was not intended to include, um, uh, an engineering analysis or um, a broad treatment of the social sciences. It was really uh, primarily focused on the biophysical uh, uh, and ecological uh, impacts uh, and character of a changing climate with um, um, some uh, attention to the linkage to the economy. And then the final chapter was uh, the identifications of some information needs, what were priority areas um, that required additional or um, priority areas for additional research. Uh, pretty much all of the areas need additional research, but 
uh, what was what were critical areas to focus on. And that was uh, intended to speak uh, to all of the working groups, but as well to the legislature and, and, and um, elected officials who would be making decisions going forward on, on funding and, and investments. Uh, so these are uh, some key deliverables that came from the Science and Technical Subcommittee uh, report uh, that were particularly important for the deliberations of the, uh, uh, the main uh, climate um, council. Uh, we provided, you know, through those chapters, a summary of impacts uh, to uh, human and animal health, economy, forest, and agricultural systems, as, as mentioned. Uh, we were particularly charged as a committee to um, to identify sea level rise projections for the state of Maine uh, out to 2100, um, and um, and we did. Uh, the, we did an initial estimate of the uh, contribution of Maine forests. Uh, to the annual carbon budget. I'll show you that in a, uh, in a minute. Uh, and we identified information needs. Uh, and then the final, uh, we identified uh, methods to build resilience, um, which uh, was included in our reporting, uh, particularly for the state's species, as was required in the, in the legislation. But a lot of the response to, for uh, adaptation and resilience uh, Kim comes from the working groups. Uh, and so the scientific and technical subcommittee wasn't charged with coming up with recommendations of what should be done, uh, but to provide the science for the working groups to answer the question, uh, what should be done? And then ultimately the, uh, the council itself. So just some examples of the kind of um, science that were, was in the report. Uh, to no one's surprise, uh, information about uh, temperature. These are primarily in English units because in Maine we use, uh, and legislators use, uh, you know, feet and inches and Fahrenheit. And so our report, uh, uh, re regrettably in the sense of uh, a, a better norm uh, would be obviously the metric system. But in order to speak to the decision makers that this was targeted for, um, we, we consistently have chose those units. So anyway, um, you know, we, we had uh, data that demonstrated that Maine is warming like the rest of the planet. Um, it's warming, uh, the minimums are warming faster than the maximums. The winters are warming faster than other seasons, uh, which are having, uh, of course, its, its own uh, profound effects. Um, the six warmest years on record in Maine have all occurred since 1998, not not the same uh, trajectory, the six warmest, uh, as you all know, uh, globally have been the last six. Um, we included a projection of climate going forward. Um, and a lot of this work is done by a, a, a young scientist named uh, Sean Burkle. He's in the Climate Change Institute. He's our state climatologist um, and runs the climate office. Um, some of you may have come across the climate reanalyzer that we have at the University of Maine. The, um, and if, if not, you might enjoy uh, checking it out on the Climate Change Institute uh, website here at the, clim uh, the University of Maine. It's a really a wonderful tool for uh, climate and meteorological data. Um, uh, Sean uh, is the, the master behind uh, these uh, model projections using CMIP5 multimodel means. Um, and um, this shows that, uh, you know, back 100 years, we've uh, continued to warm here. These are air temperatures in Maine um, with the projections of between one to four degrees by 2050 and up to uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 5.6 degrees centigrade uh, by the end of the century. And we make the point that uh, which of these trajectories we follow uh, up to 2050, uh, it's pretty much uh, locked in after 2050. It depends on uh, what we do today and every day between now and, uh, and that, uh, that time period. Uh, we looked at ocean temperatures uh, in Maine. Um, uh, we have about 3,500 miles of uh, uh, coast, closer to 5,000, uh, yeah, closer to 5,000 if you count the islands. Um, so uh, the ocean is uh, a critical part of, uh, of Maine's um, economy and, and society um, and ecology. 
Uh, and our oceans are uh, warming faster than 99% um, of the world's oceans, it's often said, from work done at the uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And Dave Reed Miller's uh, on this call, and um, it's, it's his, his institute that has been in Andy Pershing, who uh, was there at the time that led that work, um, which is having a profound impact on, uh, on our state, on our fisheries. Uh, these are projections using a low and a high uh, scenario going forward. Um, this is the period in here. This is the period in here that uh, earned the record for um, the rapid pace of warming in the Gulf of Maine. Um, Maine's uh, major fishery is is lobsters, uh, and it's dominated by lobsters now since the the big fish are uh, not gone, but not dominant. Uh, they're not major part of the fishery. Uh, but the, the centroid of, of the lobster population is, is moving north, um, has left southern New England here in the States, uh, is just off of our coast, but it will continue to migrate north. Uh, and the faster the warming, uh, the faster that migration takes place. And so uh, this, these kind of data on sea surface temperature are particularly critical to um, the decision making and, uh, and work going on in the state. Uh, likewise, sea level rise um, uh, is uh, a reality uh, in uh, many of uh, Maine's uh, coastal communities and, and cities, including our biggest city, Portland, Maine. Uh, and the, it's for this reason the, the legislation said that we needed an action plan and we specifically needed uh, projections of climate change to um, uh, 2100. Uh, most of this work was done by our uh, folks in our main geologic um, uh, survey. Uh, and this is a plot from the report um, showing the, uh, the various range of potential sea level rise. Those are all 50% uh, thresholds in, in, in that plot. Um, but probably what has gotten the most um, uh, attention was our, um, our uh, recommendations for the state uh, uh, that were twofold. One was to commit to manage for uh, sea level rise associated with um, between 1.1 and 1.8 feet by 2050, and potentially between three and 4.6 uh, feet by uh, 2100. Uh, committing meaning uh, plan like it's, there's no doubt it will happen. Uh, the decisions should uh, essentially assume that this is a reality. Uh, because of the high probability of occurrence. Uh, like in addition, we uh, indicated that uh, we should prepare to manage <coughs> for a likely range of sea level rise associated with uh, a high level of emission scenario, uh, which could bring 2.6 to, uh, 2 .6 to 3.2 feet by 2050 and 7.7 .7 to almost 10 feet um, by 2100. And so while this is a lower probability, um, um, scenario, it has a much higher impact scenario, and, and um, this is uh, an important component for decision making, uh, particularly for infrastructure uh, all along the, uh, the coast of our, our state. Uh, there is a lot of other information in other chapters, um, biodiversity as in, in uh, all of our, our, our states and countries that are uh, strongly natural resource based. Um, is really important. Um, shifting uh, ice cover and shorter winters and expansions of pests, um, lack of cold uh, water refugia in, in, in lakes. Um, that's, a, that's a main moose that's uh, looking pretty scruffy because these, uh, these animals are being burdened by uh, thousands and thousands of winter ticks that essentially bleed them dry and they're scraping against trees to try and knock them off. Um, uh, as, as well, of course, as human health impacts, we, we never had uh, a, big, a big tick problem in the state of Maine, and we did not have Lyme disease. Um, now Lyme disease covers the entire state and has changed our relationship to nature, uh, as well as uh, babesiosis and anaplasmosis and, uh, and other vector-borne diseases. Uh, this is the um, carbon budget I mentioned. Uh, a small group, this was not a major funded effort, uh, a small group uh, of us at the university and, and uh, a couple of others um, met periodically for a few months to come up with an estimate to the best of our ability uh, on um, 
Maine's carbon cycle, Maine, the carbon budget of Maine. This is just a, an image from a, a larger diagram that um, encompasses all aspects from blue carbon to uh, rivers and lakes and, and uh, wetlands. Um, but Maine is 89% forested. Uh, and so the lion's share of the carbon balance is being uh, influenced by our forests. Uh, and, and so this, the, the image on the right uh, is, um, the data are not something we need to go through here, but it's pointing out the forest farms and, and, and urban areas to some extent, mostly as a source. Um, uh, are the areas that comprised the data on, uh, on the left. And um, what that table is telling you is that in Maine, we uh, calculated that our forests are growing faster than we are harvesting them now. That's not necessarily always the case, so uh, long-term, uh, but they are in the recent uh, past. Uh, so much so that they are sequestering about 60% of the fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions uh, that the state is producing. And so it's a, uh, not a legal offset, but in a, a spreadsheet sense, a 60% offset of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then if we include forest products, durable forest products, so this isn't firewood, this isn't paper, um, this is dimension lumber or uh, other uh, uh, mass timber types of, uh, of products, um, you, it counts for another about 15%. So right now, Maine is already um, uh, in debt to our forests for uh, sequestering about 75% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of energy and work ongoing now to see how we can both build resilience in our forests as well as uh, both uh, maintain or potentially increase uh, forest products that are durable, um, as well as uh, increase and, and protect forest carbon uh, on the stump or in the woods. Uh, and those are, those are challenging tall orders and, and a lot of work is going on uh, around that. Uh, and we are looking at um, natural climate solutions uh, as in that context. And, and so this, these data I'm showing you come from a group led by uh, uh, Adam Dagenau here at the University of Maine that is looking at alternative uh, management practices for both farms and forests um, that uh, have the potential to increase uh, carbon sequestration in these sectors, the so-called uh, natural biologic solutions or natural climate solutions that we, we see in the literature. Uh, and these are simply uh, different silvicultural strategies um, that um, show a, 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 at a relatively reasonable cost, a high potential for uh, further sequestering carbon. Um, uh, avoided conversion is uh, very expensive. The, this is based, uh, anchored on the carbon price, which drives the incentive, uh, incentivization uh, to do this work, uh, because the alternative use of the land is, is pretty high value. If you're talking about development, um, um, there's a high incentive uh, to sell your forest land for, to a developer, uh, and therefore it's very expensive to avoid that development. In agriculture, um, we have a, a pretty small a footprint of agriculture in the state. Nevertheless, there's potential to contribute um, um, a number of different practices, uh, promoting soil health uh, as, uh, and restorative agriculture are, are central to that. Um, we often see a biochar uh, as, a, as a, a big bar in these kinds of analyses, uh, biochar addition to the soil. Uh, there, there's a lot of interest in that. There's a lot known about that. Um, uh, however, in the in the Northeast, the biochar uh, industry is essentially uh, fledgling at best, with uh, a lot of questions about uh, how that will develop going forward. So this too is guiding uh, decision making and policy. Uh, all of which led to the uh, eight climate uh, action strategies in the main uh, climate action plan. Uh, Maine won't wait. Um, I'm uh, not going to take the time this morning here to, uh, to describe the uh, details for each of those, uh, but very uh, quickly, uh, these three really focused on mitigation. Uh, and so embrace the future of transportation is about electrifying transportation, as we mentioned. Modernized buildings has a lot to do with installation of heat pumps and weatherization. Um, uh, reducing carbon emissions from energy production 
has a lot to do or is uh, particularly about uh, increasing uh, the percent, the renewable portfolio um, to 80% renewables in our electric grid by uh, 2030 and 100% uh, by 2050. These five strategies um, uh, focus not, uh, not um, uh, to the exclusion of any mitigation uh, uh, benefits, but uh, squarely on uh, adaptation and resilience. Um, uh, Grow Maine's clean energy economy is about building our economy with uh, renewable energy jobs uh, and some of the jobs in the new areas of bioproducts. Um, strategy E, protect Maine's environment, working lands and waters. Uh, and develop a program to uh, incentivize carbon sequestration, um, increase the percent of our lands that are in conservation of working lands but that are in some level of conservation to keep them as, as farms and forests. Uh, build healthy and resilient communities. This is about community-based uh, level planning in particular. Um, action plans in these coastal communities are uh, are uh, a, a critical uh, area of work and, and a number of organizations are active, uh, such as the uh, GMRI, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute that I mentioned. Um, invest in climate ready infrastructure, do a risk assessment of, of infrastructure throughout the state, uh, particularly incorporating the sea level rise uh, uh, rec uh, 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 recommendations uh, into current policy. And, and that work is already ongoing. And then engage people and communities uh, this is a lot about uh, getting the word out about climate change. What is it? How can we respond? What's the state program um, in public schools and in uh, various uh, public settings, as well as developing um, the workforce that we need in order to, uh, to do this work going forward? And that's uh, retraining for, uh, in some cases, and uh, a lot of uh, training of the young workforce that's uh, graduating now and looking for careers um, to give them the skills that that this plan uh, will require. So I did a lousy job of setting my timer, so I don't know how long I was, but um, that's a, a walkthrough of the, okay, good. Um, the walkthrough of Maine's climate action plan and the work that is ongoing. Um, the, the plan was delivered in December. Um, we all went and, you know, in our pandemic mode, did what we did for the holidays um, and then came back in, in January in 2021 um, with a, a tremendous flurry of activity uh, focused on uh, implementation. Um, the the um, uh, action plan will be renewed every four years. And so this is not a singular plan that goes into the, the sunset, uh, but 2024 and 2028, presumably, um, there will be updates to the action plan. Uh, and the, the council and the working groups and the scientific and technical subcommittee and the equity subcommittee, all are ongoing entities that are right now engaged on um, uh, sort of understanding and, and assisting in implementation. Um, and uh, our legislature is knee deep in climate related bills uh, this session, uh, but also beginning the discussion of uh, preparing for the next uh, the next plan and therefore the next assessment that we would do. And so I think I'll stop there and, and um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it back to you. Thank you. Very interesting to learn how you've done this assessment um, and especially how you in your assessments also have involved the um, private sector because in the assessments we have done in the Arctic, it was purely made by the scientists. Yeah. Yep. and made policy relevant recommendations based on science. I think this is a very interesting discussion to see how you can bring in, because over lessons from the North Sea was that when we brought in the politicians, they started to close information. Yep. They didn't like to show this information to the scientists. So we, when we designed the Arctic, we said, keep the politicians two arm lengths away. Yeah, well, we, we had, we've had, We've had experiences parallel to that, depending on which administration was in office in Washington, D.C. or, or here in Maine. Um, but uh, because of that very, uh, very issue, the politics of our times, uh, it's probably more important than ever that um, the private sector uh, and businesses, industry, communities are, are part of the process uh, along with the scientists um, we have another gubernatorial election uh, coming up in another year, 
and and so uh, for this plan to move forward, um, we need folks in office who support it and support the science that that defines it. Uh, and we've experienced it both ways <laughs> when they did and when they didn't. Uh, and, and and so that coalition, I think, is is essential for this to to be able to persist into the future. Okay, questions. Um, Jenny, if you see any symbols, I am. Um, of people who wants to take the floor. I think Rasmus has it. Rasmus, okay. I don't see it here in my screen, so. Um. Yes, uh, let me go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very informative, very interesting. And following up on uh, something Lars Otto just asked, uh, this thing about in, um, involving social partners. Uh, Lars Otto mentioned the business, the employer side. Um, I'm Danish myself, and in Denmark, we have a very well-organized labor market with very strong both employer side organizations and very strong employee organizations, uh, trade unions. And that makes it possible to make, how to say, very solid um, tripartite government employer employee uh, policy. Um, so uh, how, do you, uh, how do you involve the employee side in this work? Hmm. Because um, it's it's very it's very very important and and I see that I'm a professor of political science myself, and I see I see very often when people talk about business and industry and involving business and industry, uh, I see many fellow academics who are not very conscious that they are only talking about the employer side. They're not talking about the employee side. Yeah. Um. Good question. Um, uh, I, I don't think our process uh, is, is focused on that question specifically. Um, I think the equity assessment uh, and the equity subcommittee that has been established um, squarely includes those kinds of considerations as they uh, provide input to the the uh, strategies, but more importantly now, provide input on how those strategies are and, and will be implemented. Uh, some of the members of the working groups, uh, it was not just business, it was not just members of the employer group, uh, but there were examples of employees that were on some of the, uh, some of the working groups. Um, in some of the important sectors, it's um, yeah, uh, yeah, correct. Uh, in in some of the sectors, it's um, I, it's a little different distinction, I think. Um, and I, if you think about um, our lobster industry, which is extremely important uh, economically and socially, and um, it, it's really represented by the coalition of the lobster men and women themselves. And, and uh, you know, a, a lobster man is on the committees. It's not a company uh, or an employer that's representing that the lobster sector per se. Um, you know, we, in the forestry side, we have foresters, uh, we have wildlife managers, we have landowners that are uh, uh, part of the uh, process. Um, although we also have representatives of, uh, of the industry itself. Um, that are, you know, speaking to the deliberation. So I, I, I think you raise a good question, uh, and I don't think we've addressed it rigorously as you've posed it. Um, I, but I don't think we, the, our process has been exclusive um, to just the employers. Uh, and for a couple of reasons, one is there are employees that are part of it, and in some areas that are really important from the industrial side, um, there's really not a, an employer that's speaking for them. They're speaking themselves uh, as a coalition. And I think, you know, the far, in, in farming, we see that in agriculture in Maine, a lot of small farmers um, in, um, in uh, the fishing uh, 
as well as uh, in forestry. In the forest sector, it's probably a little, uh, well, maybe not. And, and Dave Reed Miller's on this phone. He could speak to the, the marine sector and the fishery sector better than, uh, better than I. But you have both the, the private forest landowners and, and managers and foresters that work for companies, and you have representatives of um, trade organizations representing uh, the companies themselves. Um, and I, I think it's it, there's somewhat parallel in the marine sector. So thank yes. you for that question. I see that we have um, Karin have a question. Yes, thank you very much. Really impressive and, and very interesting. Thank I you. have uh, three scientific questions, uh -oh. which can be answered, I hope, shortly. One is, do you also consider other greenhouse gases apart from carbon, let's say methane or uh, nitrogen oxides, etc., in especially in the modeling? Uh, another question was, uh, you had a temperature low in the 1960s after a high uh, in 1945-50. Is there a possibility that this is an oscillation which will come back uh, so that you, know, you get another low? rather than a, a steady increase. And the last question, sorry about this. No, no, that's good. Wood, you mentioned wood as a carbon storage. In Germany, we have massive problems due to drought mm -hmm. and wood boring beetles, which are spreading like mad and have destroyed really vast areas of forest. So it is a, a difficult um, and not terribly reliable storage. Um, it's very difficult also to forecast, of course. So that were my three questions. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, let me let me see if I can take them uh, one at a time here. Um, the the um, greenhouse gases, uh, other greenhouse gases, are included in the state's greenhouse gas inventory, and so when we're comparing, you know, offsets and the, um, it, it, it's not a perfect comparison, but yeah, as with everything, it's complicated. But the um, CO2 uh, carbon dioxide equivalents that are being reported for greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Maine uh, include the calculated transfer for methane, for nitrous oxide. So the DEP reporting does include um, essentially all of the greenhouse gases. The carbon budget that I talked about, that we did the statewide carbon budget, um, did not. And so we were really just focused on carbon. We would not, we would not have the data uh, in, in for, uh, you know, to include uh, methane and, and uh, particularly nitrous oxide, for example, in the forest sector. Uh, and so, you know, version one of that state level budget um, was just focused on carbon. So we were comparing carbon offset taken up by the forest expressed as CO2 equivalents to Maine's comprehensive greenhouse gas emissions expressed as CO2 equivalents when we did that, uh, did that calculation. Um, the second question, um, yes, I, I think uh, I don't have the plot handy. Otherwise, I, uh, our, my, my colleague Sean in, in the Climate Change Institute, you know, has a, um, a good uh, plot of the uh, long-term average. You, we could see it in, in the plot I showed you. Uh, we have highs and lows that are a teleconnection of, uh, of, of some of these patterns, but the, the lows keep getting higher uh, every time we run through the cycle. And so, you know, here in the States, we hear a lot about we were talking about a return to the ice age in the 70s uh, because we were in the, in a low uh, of that uh, AMO cycle um, uh, and from ENSO and, and, and then it got warm again. So yes, uh, and we've talked a, a lot about that. I'm not a, as, as uh, mentioned, I'm a soil scientist, so I'm not the one that's uh, doing this kind of modeling. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still ongoing debate, I think, about uh, will we, Will we uh, either be stationary for a decade and then come tearing out of that, or we would continue to warm? Have we broken that cycle, uh, given the amount of warming that we've had? Uh, so uh, yes, we could have uh, 
um, uh, some level of decline. I, I haven't heard anyone predicting that we'd go back to the 60s, um, but it could stabilize for a period of time, um, but uh, and then and then return to a warming. The the risk with that is uh, that it, it if it do, did that, it would divert the attention of the public to the crisis, and when we resumed, we would resume with great vigor. Uh, at a warming that it, it would be even more uh, more catastrophic than what we face right now. So my that's so that's my understanding of, of what I've learned from others. Um, and then on wood, um, woods are you you raise a, a great um, point. Um, the uh, um, uh, oh yeah, Lloyd's still on. Yeah, Lloyd Erland probably would can give you a, a better answer on uh, on this. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of attention on the possibility of using more wood and as a renewable energy source. Um, but uh, it, number one, if we store more wood in the forest, uh, it, it's vulnerable to being lost. You pointed out drought, insects, and disease. It, it doesn't it doesn't stay there forever. And if we filled up the forest, then it then we will have to maintain that carbon, otherwise it's gonna come pouring out uh, into the atmosphere. And climate brings uh, additional risks of, of insects, uh, bark beetle that we have out west and, and much like you have in, in Germany, uh, drought, um, uh, which normally we have not thought a lot about here in Maine. Since roughly 2016, we've had um, significant seasonal drought as well as full-blown drought uh, last year. And, and we'll see where we're, we're already heading towards that uh, this year that has a big impact on, on forests. So depending on our forests um, as a, a carbon solution comes with significant risks. Uh, you know, first and mm -hmm. foremost, get off fossil fuels. And, and, uh, uh, and, and then I, I, think I, I think of a priority in our forests to be building resilience in our forests um, and preventing uh, development. Um, because there's nothing that makes carbon flow from a forest like uh, cutting it down and, and putting in a parking lot. Uh, and, and there's significant pressure to do that as well. So I've, I haven't answered that very precisely, but those are just some thoughts on number three. That's a good answer. I see time is running and I have two more, Oysten and Mike. So Oysten first and then Mike. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I also received my question in the chat. It is about carbon neutrality for a limited land area like Maine. Your industrial emissions are 9% of your total. In the US, the average is 23%. In the EU, 25%. But China has grown to 65 which means that China has become the industrial producer, and we all import it. And we don't count our embedded carbon, which means that carbon neutrality for a small piece of land like Maine doesn't really make sense as long as you don't count your embedded CO2 import. No argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think carbon neutrality is uh, uh, politically, it's, uh, it, it's another milepost to work towards. Uh, I, was, you know, I think it was important early on that there was uh, an, an emphasis on our greenhouse gas targets not being a net target, but being gross greenhouse gas reductions. And so um, our 80% and 45% uh, and 80% uh, reductions are gross greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but the uh, carbon neutrality is, is fraught with challenges. Um, most that you know, you've already addressed, um, a lot of it simply being able to measure um, whether we're actually doing that, uh, that or not. So. Uh, I, uh, I completely agree. Thank you. Mike. Um, so first, a response to Car one of Karn's comments about the cooling in the 1960s and 50s. That was a period of very high sulfate emissions in North America. And so that was a period, and so Maine is sort of downwind of, of both the Ohio River Valley and, and the Canadian emissions and, and stuff that were coming. So that might well have been a reason. So it's not clear it would be cyclical. My question really has to do with um, sort of like um, Oysen's comment about considering things from outside the state 
what kinds of, of things matter. Um, so the project B2B is interested in the Atlantic Ocean. What things around the Atlantic Ocean are gonna matter that you're really concerned about? Greenland is certainly one. But, but another one is it's such a desirable place if you thought about all the people who are gonna be moving there, including <laughs> Bob Carell, who happens to live at 18 inches above sea level in Florida. And, well, and we, we welcome and Bob we keep, back. We keep warning him about it and, and his excuse for doing so is to say, well, I may be, what is it, 85 now, Bob? And I rent, um, so I think he'll be headed up there and you're going to get up you're likely to get an awful lot of people moving there uh yes that's that's true we we do talk about that uh, i i think we're beginning to live that there's been a, a boom in real estate just from the pandemic alone uh and when when society moves on from the pandemic then they'll uh, fully enmesh in the the much larger and longer term crisis of uh, of the climate even more uh, and and move to Maine. So yeah, we we I, I think collectively we have thought about that. Um, there's no um, there's no specific task force on that topic at this point in time. Um, but um, I, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, our, our license plate in Maine on our vehicles says vacation land, and I've always worried that that might work better than we wanted to. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah. And my sister already lives there, so yeah. Oh, okay, wonderful. <laughs> well, I think there are more places that have to prepare for the migration of people moving north. Yeah, due to several reasons. That's the. But I think that time is running. We have been talking a very interesting period now for one hour, and we still have one another agenda item, and that has been asked to Mike to lead. The next session about yeah, if we can agree on the paper, important environmental sustainable realities issues. So, Mike, are you ready to take over? Could I just interject? I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to depart. I've got to go give another talk in, okay. in literally in a few minutes. I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here this, this morning and, and to meet all of you. And uh, I look forward to following the, the development thank, of, of thank, your work. Ivan, thank you very, very much. I deeply yep. appreciate it. We all give you a vote of applause and appreciation. And one of these days, if you'll send me your home address, I'm going to send you this wonderful book called oh. Maine to Greenland by our two colleagues at the Smithsonian. It's a great book. I'll send it to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.